everyone. We're going to be doing some watercolour drawings of birds this morning. I hope you really enjoy it. It's a nice, nice little project. Now I'm only working small. I've got a piece of A5 paper here. Um, the picture is on an A4 so you can see that A5 should be half the size of an A4 and I've got my reference image that I'm going to be working on. Now I would love to draw a kingfisher in the wild but if anyone that's seen them like I have they are so fast all you pretty much get is this blue shimmer of light that goes past your eye so it's pretty much impossible. Then um, with such a situation with, with a beautiful subject like kingfisher you're better off going with a picture. They're also really tiny a lot smaller than I thought it would be. But that is going off on a tangent. So I've got my reference image here, um, which is royalty free from Pixels. Pixel Baby. Pixel Bay. Pixel Baby. Where'd that come from? You can see it's only morning. Um, which is a nice, detailed, crisp edged picture. The best type to work from. Then I've got my piece of watercolour paper over here on my left. Now it's not the most perfect piece, I've got a few splodges over it. But it'll do, just to give you a quick demo. I'm working in a HB pencil, so I've got my standard HB pencil, which I've sharpened up. Um, got a little bit of a dodgy point, but you should have a nice sharp pencil when working on this. And HB is fairly decent. You do have to be quite gentle on your pressure, so keep an eye on how I'm handling the pencil and where your hand position should be. You will also need an eraser or a rubber. Um, a putty rubber is probably better than a standard traditional rubber because it means it won't break up the fibres of the watercolour paper. You may find that a traditional rubber will end up um, causing a bit of damage and when you lay down your colour you'll see that it breaks up a little bit. So do be careful about using a traditional eraser on a piece of watercolour paper. This is 300 GSM, so it's fairly thick. Should take um, a few layerings, which will be nice, but a lot of this project is being quick, cute little mini studies. Okay, so on that theory, we'll get it down fairly quickly. Now, I'm going to shut up talking because, my God, I can rub it on, I know, and start getting this sketch out. First of all, make sure that you're holding the pencil towards the end, and there's a few different ways to approach this type of drawing. This one I'm going to show you by blocking it in. So first of all, it's really good to have your picture as a hard copy because as a hard copy you can draw on it and get a rough idea of simplistic shapes different core components of the picture are made from. So you can see this triangular wing okay, and you've got this body which is kind of an off-centre triangle again and you've got a, a rectangle tail it makes life a lot easier. Also, look at the length of the beak. Now, the amount of times when students are drawing any form of bird, their beaks either become really long like Pinocchio's nose or really short. You've got to be aware of how long this beak is in relationship to how big the head is. That should then help you draw it across. So, working on the base that I want to get in, <laughs> I'm going to start sketching out a simplistic shape of the head. <coughs> Sorry, I just have a quick drink there, that's why I'm just coughing my guts up. <coughs> now I'm holding the pencil towards the end and I'm going darker with my lines so that you can see my approach to this. Okay. Okay, let's get that body in. Oh, he's looking a bit Boxy, like Volkswagen, boxy but good. Just like that. Um, and then I've got this tail coming in here. I've got also this triangular wing, which is going to be kind of around there. And then let's whack that beak in. Now look at that angle running for it. If I put my pencil so it's horizontal, you can see the angle of the beak in relationship to the horizontal line. Go and make sure that I'm getting the same angle as that. I'm going to put that in there and then flex it up the triangle. Now I think I'm going a little bit too long. So if I measure the beak and I'm going from where the beak comes into the head, so from here to the end, I'm holding my pencil and just laying up my nail. Okay, so my beak is slightly short of the head. 
So if I bring my pencil in, yeah, the end of my beak should be there. That's how big my head is because my beak is probably just over two thirds of the length of the head. Now, once I've got that in, which hopefully everyone can see, yeah, that looks pretty good on the camera. I'll just do a bull check. Then we slide your hand down the pencil and we start getting in some detail. Actually, I'm just going to wipe that log in and a quick bit here. Right, so you can see it's a very boxy, simplistic bird, but it's roughly, I've got it nice and centre, so it's not falling off. I was a little bit worried about the beak, but I think I've just got that about in. A little bit of play, and I haven't got any of the wings here. I've got a little bit of flex that I can throw in, because you can see like this feather overshoots the body. But generally, it's sitting nicely square on my piece of paper, which is the aim of the game. I'm just going to box in the eye, so if I use that beak line that I should be sitting above it and I'm just looking by eye so I'm looking at the gap here in relationship to the gap there in relationship to the gap of the eye now I'd say that eye is about double that gap so that looks pretty good right so I slide my hand down and I'm going to start refining my shapes now, I'm not trying to have my hand right close to the end. I'm trying to come up about this position. This means that I'm going to be drawing a lot more from my wrist. So my lines will be fairly straight. And also my lines will be a little bit darker. Because the downward pressure naturally will increase. Meanwhile, I apologise for the chewing noise. Which is my dog sitting by my feet eating biscuits. It's alright for some, eh? ignore that now you can see how things are moving and becoming a little bit more refined what you might find with something which has patterns such as um, this kingfisher it's good to put in some rough boundaries of areas with different colors this will double check that your spacing is correct between areas of detail yeah it looks pretty good so you can see that bit looks fairly decent and I've got my wing coming in over here because I've got two triangles I've got this bigger triangle and then the smaller triangle sitting on top so if I bring that smaller triangle in bring that up over there roughly then I've got my wing which is coming down here and arching up into various different feathers I've got my tail coming down here and then there's some feathers as well poking off around the corner of that tail coming up and over still a bit boxy but I'm not worried about that and I'm going to come up into the leg into the belly which comes up you can see that comes up into this wing section and then you've got some more puffed out chest feathers, typical bird shape. Then I've got my wings. You can see these triangle feathers. Again, I'm just keeping it simple. I'm looking at plotting down triangles and circles and rectangles to check the spacing and scale of different parts of the artwork. And then once I'm happy with it, I can start building up the shape. And see, you should end up with something that looks like that fairly quickly, fairly easy. Now, once you've got that, then you're looking at giving it a little bit of a clean up because you've got all those guidelines. So, take your putty rubber and go around and start taking out all your sketchy little guidelines. So, you can see here I'm shortening my beak, I'm coming in for my head shape, I'm taking out those excess lines that made it a little bit thicker where I was just working out the head shape. Okay, it looks pretty decent for a quick sketch. Now we've got to do the watercolour. So let's get those out. I'm working with pans 
um, you cut you get watercolour into two different forms the tubes and the pans <coughs> I personally prefer the pans because I find the tubes have a habit of going hard after a period of time the tubes will give you a stronger and more intense colour don't get me wrong they're really good to have but um, pans will just last forever as long as you don't wear them out and obviously if you wear them out you're not too worried now what you'll find is usually you end up with a mix of both. I use the tubes for areas that I traditionally know I do big washes in. So when I'm out landscape painting, I'll have a cerulean blue in a tube because I can whack down a really nice strong sky colour using that and the lemon yellow. I'll also have an ultramarine blue in a tube. Again, because I'm doing seascapes, it just makes sense. Where with pans, it takes a little bit more time to get the colour out. And it's a, a lot more softer in tone due to the dilution of water. So it depends on what you're doing, um, on which watercolour form is the best for you. Now with this, because I'm working in the studio and I'm doing small bits of detail, the pans are quite nice to handle on that level. They'll also mean that I can't go too strong too quickly and I'm less likely to make mistakes, which is always a good thing with watercolour because there's no turning back if you do go too dark. You'll see that I have also two containers of clean water. Now this one I've put next to my pan because I'm going to use that for cleaning my brush. And I've got another clean water over here. Should I want to put a little bit of water down to feed one colour into another, I have that option as well. I have my palette that's just sitting along the bottom. I've got a range of different brushes. Now for the brushes, you fundamentally in painting get two types. You get a pointed head brush and you get a flat head brush. The pointed head brush is about control and detail and getting colour in certain areas. Flat headed brushes are always about giving you maximum cover in a small amount of time. So it's good to have a few of both to give you options. I have a little piece of tissue as well that I'm going to be using just for blotting up areas. Now I'm going to go in and I'm just going to use the pointed brush for a while to get a feel for this. So. We're working with watercolours, that means we have to work light to dark. That means that the eye and the beak are going to be towards the end, the oranges are going to be fairly early, and the blues are going to be later on in the process. Some points we might want to bleed a little bit of orange into blue, so we do have to keep that in mind. Watercolours are a bit like being in the A-team, you have to have a plan of action. So it's good to take a few minutes out just to think through what you're planning on doing and which colours are going to be your first kind of working order. I'm going to put in a little bit of water over here and then I'm going to grab in a little bit of the orange. Now you can make orange which is usually quite a nice way. I prefer to make because if you make a colour you can control it much easier in tone and saturation where if you're using a pre-made colour it's always far more difficult to do that. Alright, so I've got my lemon yellow, I'm adding a little bit of cadmium red. It's usually always a good concoction for a nice orange. If in doubt, have a spare piece of paper, do a splodge on and see if you need to up your orange. You can see there it looks a little bit too yellowy. I'm going to grab a little bit more red. That looks closer to the mark. We've got a little bit of yellow going around here. So I'm going to work from the top down, that way I won't lean on it. I'm also going to first of all just grab a little bit more of that yellow, just up in the top corner so it's nice and light. Because there's a little bit more yellow around here. And I'm going to start putting that yellow down first. I'm going to then pick up a little bit of the orange and just dab it in the orange bleeds in. Now you do have to be careful when you're using watercolours to the angle of your sketch board because it can be that if you've got it up to too high an angle it will all run down. Keep that in mind. And if you find like you've got a little bit of white there and you've gone too orange just tap grab a bit of your tissue and blot it out while it's still wet. You have to catch it while it's wet and work when it's once it dries. You can see there you can just blot out a bit of colour. Yeah, feed a little bit more orange just up there. Got a little bit of orange around the beak. 
putting it in. Now once you put watercolour down and you've got any pencil line as you can see here, you will not be able to remove the pencil line. So you do have to make sure that you've removed any pencil line that you don't want. With that in mind, I'm going to just take off the edge of that line there. Then I'm going to come in and down here it's a lighter orange. If I grab in a little bit more water, I can dilute my pigment down so it's a bit softer. Now I'm going to just clean my brush, take a little bit of that clean water and splunge that in. See that's technical, splunging. What can I say? Also going to take out a little bit more of that because I want a little bit of yellow in there. So if I take out a little bit of that orange, once it dries I can throw in a bit more orange and make it a touch zappier. And then I'm going to come down, gently brush in some orange down here. As you can see I'm leaving the areas of blue, leaving the areas of white. I'm putting in only where the colour needs to go. I'm thinking about the type of brush marks I'm using as well. So I'm kind of being very flicking, thinking of feathers. Come down here. Now I can see a little bit of orange up here. It's even a little bit mild up there. I might dilute this. Actually I'm going to clean my brush, take some fresh water, add a little bit of water in on top of the paper so it's clean water. Then I'm going to pick up a little bit of that orange and just feed it in. Okay, very diluted and very mild. And it will flow only where the water holds. A little bit more on that feather. And then I'm going to come down where it gets a little bit more dense in colour. Bring that in. You can still move things around. I'm going to take a little bit more of that red. Intensify down here. Because it's dry now, the red should stay where I'm putting it. I noticed before it was moving around because it was still damp on the paper. It acts like little valleys and colour reservoirs. Now I'm going to look at putting in some blue. And you should see a, a real dramatic jump in the artwork. For this blue, this is more like a cerulean blue. Um, let me see what I've got. So, so I might have to play around with this. Actually, I've got an intense blue. Which might be a good one. What does that look like? Sometimes. Yeah, you see that's an intense blue. That looks pretty good. And I think a lot of these kind of studio sets come with an... Intense blue, it's quite a common colour. I'm grabbing some clean water. I'm going to grab a little bit of intense blue. And with blue you'll find a small amount goes a long way. Now, I'm going to just clean my brush. And dilute that down a little bit more. Always wise to be safe with these and over dilute. Gradually building it up. I'm going to put some in the head. You can see as it gets back to the head it gets more intense. So I'm going to increase the amount of blue pigment within the paint to exaggerate that intensity of colour. Just like so. And it's pretty much like rinse and repeat around here. I'm adding in a little bit of mild blue down here. Now I'll pick up a bit of pigment. I feed my pigment into that area. And it's all about handling the brush. You can see I'm like dotting down. Now it looks like there's a little bit of a green there. I'm going to grab got a nice green. Oh, well, it's quite sharp, but hey, let's go with it. A bit of that green mixed in with the intense blue. It look pretty good. Yeah, 
a shippy case, something that looks like this. So, what I need to do is probably allow this to dry a bit because then we can come in on a second layer and just make that look really fresh and strong with the blue. So while that's all drying and settling down, I'm going to come and do a little bit down here of the twig, well the branch I'm sitting on, and be using a little bit of yellow ochre. Now do keep an eye on your water that you're using for cleaning your brush. You do need to try and keep it as clean as possible or you're going to get cross contamination. I'm going to work back in. So you can see that I'm still working on it. I'm just going to up my orange a little bit more my intensity. So a little bit more my yellow, a little bit more my calcium red. Maybe that's a bit too much. Mm, yeah, probably is. Add a bit more yellow and a little bit of water. And then come in. So I just want that really zappy, beautiful orange contrast down here. A little bit of feather work, a bit sharper up here. Take my tissue, clean off there, take my brush, grab a little bit of water, grab a little bit of my intense blue that I was using. Make sure it's nice and strong. And then work a little bit more in. It's looking pretty good. Okay, so let's go in with a little bit of a neutral tint and start bringing in some of the dark shadows, shall we? Right, I'm going to just make a neutral tint. I'm going to take some crimson red. I'm going to take some ultramarine blue to make it a strong purple. a bit of cadmium yellow which should make it go to a grey tone if all is well. You need to be very careful and gently add it in and you'll see that the colour kind of goes to a dark grey tone. Now this is preferred by watercolourists over using black because black can be a bit of a flat colour. Optically it doesn't give you a great depth. There you go. This is meant to give you much more of a, a realistic result. So I'm just putting in the beak. I'm going to clean my brush. And I'm going to go in and do a little bit on the eyes as well. So be careful with the eyes. Don't go too dark too quick. Watch out for any areas of reflection on the lens because it will make it look more realistic. Now I've got to build up the darker patterns with the feathers around certain parts of the face and the head. My blue is still a bit damp so that can be handy because it means that it will naturally blend in.
Right, so that's just a quick sketch to get you started. You can see there, working everything wet into wet ultimately. You could put background in which would make it really come forward, but at the moment it's too wet. If I did it, the blue and the various colours would merge out into the black gand and you would lose your kingfisher, or I would lose my kingfisher. So I would say a little bit of patience, a cup of tea, a cookie, and then come back and do it and you'll have a really beautiful artwork. Okay, so I hope you enjoy it and now it's your turn. Bye everyone.